Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings, Richard. It's good to see you. Uh, I just want to welcome everybody to the webinar. Again, my name is Dexter Van Zyl, and I am the editor of Focus on Western Islamism, which was uh, founded earlier this year. And I'm going to be moderating an interview with Richard Landis. He's a former professor at Boston University and a senior fellow at Bar Ilan University. And he currently serves as the count chair of the Council of Scholars for Middle East Peace in the Middle East. And he's written several books, uh, most recently, the whole, Can the Whole World Be Wrong? Lethal Journalism, Anti-Semitism, and Global Jihad. Uh, I think I've got the title right. Now, many of you are probably familiar with his writings on cognitive warfare and a phrase that I like very much, uh, proleptic dimitude from his blog, The Augean Stables. And before we begin, I'd like to remind our listeners that they can submit questions at the bottom of the screen by posting them in the Q&A section. And so I just want to begin by saying uh, greetings, and uh, it's really good to see you, Richard. Thank you. And uh, Western intellectuals and public figures like Bill Nye and Ben Affleck, who you mentioned in your text, and others, a whole bunch of people respond to attacks on the West with remorse, guilt, and self-hate. And they often internalize Islamist message that view or portray Israel in the United States as particular enemies to be destroyed. And they seem to be neighbors or almost like co-proprietors, co co if you pardon the expression, in this landscape of millennial discourse about the evils of the West and it serving as an obstacle to the, this utopia. What happened? Just talk to me. What happened, Richard? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I mean, I, I actually start the story in 2000. Um, now granted, a lot of the stuff had already happened. Saeed had written his book uh, in which any criticism of the Arabs or in his third book on covering Islam, any criticism of Islam was a form of Western racism and prejudice and ugliness and so on. Um, so, and that had by 2000 pretty much taken over academia, uh, certainly taken over Middle Eastern studies and a number of other adjacent, <laughs> let's call them uh, post-Orientalist adjacent fields like sociology, anthropology, and so on. Um, but I argue that in 2000, something, it, it's like all of that was a super saturated solution and 2000 was the seed crystal. So it crystallized into a, a basic feature of the Western public sphere. And uh, if you want to, we can go into what actually happened in 2000, but in 2001 at Durban, which was a conference that started in later August and ended three days before 9-11, you had a sort of full-fledged, I call it a marriage, between what I call pre-modern sadism and post-modern masochism, between the, sort of the red-green alliance, if you will. Um, you had uh, NGOs, who, you know, their sacred theme was human rights, uh, lining up with and joining forces with um, some of the most regressive groups on the planet. Um, and so as a result, and, and the key thing in that unification was the adoption by both sides. I mean, they had already both more or less developed this thought, but they, they jointly targeted Israel and the United States as in millennial terms as the antichrist. Um, or in Muslim terms, the Dajjal. So from that point on, you have people on the left who are essentially viewing any kind of um, manifestation of Westernness as a kind of a sign of Antichrist. There's a tremendous illustration I give in my book of a, a picture, a, a, a graphic that was held aloft at the demonstrations in 2003 against the war in Iraq, which was another, you know, point for another strong point of this, um, this 
alliance between the progressive left and the jihadis, um, you know, in which all the signs, Nazi, dollar sign, U.S. flag, Israeli Star of David, and horns coming out of the head and so on. It's a, it's a brilliant description of the sort of antichrist of both the red and the green, um, the, the, the radical progressives on the one hand, and the global jihadis on the other. Um, and that that's enormously strong. I don't know, do you want me to describe the psychology behind it or what? Well, now the thing is, is it, see, this is the thing, is, is that we always used to joke about how some of the folks who were involved in this Islamist attack on Israel and the West in general, they would say, well, they say one thing in English and then they say another thing in Arabic. Right. Well, now they essentially say one thing in English and that same other and that other thing also in English. It's as if you know they're able to kind of give one message and say, "Look, this is we're just about human rights. This is all we're about." Right. Right. But then at the same time, they speak in explicitly anti-Western terms that make it clear they want to take the whole thing down. Well, it it is interesting. I mean, I think part of it has to do with what you might call. Uh, a, a process of growing bolder and bolder. Initially, they didn't think they could get away with saying the things that they say now. So they couched it in human rights terms. I call it demopathy, which is using human rights to destroy human rights, or as the formula repeated by many Muslims go, using democracy to destroy democracy. Um, so initially, but the, initially they would say that, and, and then they realized that Westerners didn't notice or bother, or it didn't bother them. Um, I don't think initially most people took it seriously. But, you know, we've basically absorbed a story about Palestinian nationalism. All they want is their freedom, and the Israelis are the oppressors. Um, you know, and 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 so the Palestinians have able, been able to garb their their efforts as an effort, you know, in terms of Israel denying them their human rights. Um, you know, there's no Arab country that has the kind of human rights that Arabs have in Israel, and yet somehow they managed to pull this off. So. Uh, you know, I, I just, I think that what's happened over the last 20 years is that they've just seen how foolish Western leaders are and that they can get away with just about anything. But I, I think they still, by and large, don't openly say in English what they say in Arabic. Okay. Now, one of the things that just popped into my head is, is that people always used to say, when I was reading about World War II and the rise of Nazism, this is that essentially the Spanish Civil War was essentially a prelude to a lot of the tactics and technology used to essentially uh, start the, the World War II, okay, and, and to right. fight World War II and the whole propaganda. And it, it seems as if implicitly you're arguing that an awful lot of the tactics that have been used against Israel, the Jewish state, have over the long term essentially been deployed against the West in general. Is, yeah, is I that think no, I, yeah, I think there's no question of that, um, both in terms of, you know, kinetic warfare and in terms of cognitive warfare. So, for example, in the 1990s, Hamas developed a whole theology of suicide terror, um, which, and it, it's an elaborate theology. It's not just, oh, let's go kill them. Um, <clears throat> So they developed this elaborate theology, and the Western press didn't want to call it terrorism. And so throughout the 90s, when there were these terror attacks on Israel, you'd get these, you know, NPR and, and, uh, and CNN and other outlets would uh, say, well, we don't want AP and Reuters. We don't want to use... Emotion, emotive language, that was their term. We don't want to use emotive language and we don't want to be seen taking sides and so on. And it'll look like we're taking the side of Israel if we call these attacks terrorism, um, which really is a fascinating, but it, it's a fascinating line of argument that's ridiculous. But 
uh, it covers a different thing, which is they're terrorized. You know, and when you look at the reasons they give for not using terror in specific incidents, it turns out that it's to protect their journalists because the terrorists will use terror on them to stop them from calling them terrorists. Now, what happened in, in 2000 was with the Mohammed Adoura story, which I go into detail in my first chapter on, what happened was that after the Adoura story, you know, the story of, of the, the IDF shooting and killing a boy in his father's arms deliberately, 20 minutes of fire, they shot the ambulance, they came to get him and so on, all concocted, um, but picked up by the Western media so that it spread through both the progressive world and through the um, the Muslim world um, with the power of, you know, Nidra Pola calls it an atom bomb. Um, so, so one of the things that happened was that, that even in Palestine, uh, approval of suicide bombing went from 25% to 80%. And this was true throughout the Muslim world. So for about a year before 9-11, people, including Nihad Awad, who was you know, the head of care and, and stood behind President Bush as he gave his speech about 9-11, was praising the suicide bombers. So was uh, uh, Yusuf al-Karadawi and so on. It was widespread within the Muslim world that now this was a legitimate thing to do against the true enemies of the faith. And 9-11, it got turned against America. And interestingly enough, a whole bunch of the things that had previously happened to Europe happened to America. Reuters and the BBC refused to word, use the word terrorist to describe the event, echoing the same language that they had used when they explained to the Israelis why they wouldn't do that. Um, and, uh, you know, intellectuals like Baudrillard in France, who, who considers himself the, the, the new Alexis de Tocqueville, American expert amongst the French intelligentsia said, you know, nobody who's moral cannot rejoice at 9-11 at this horrendous blow to, how did he put it? Oh, yes. Yeah, so suffocating a hegemon. So, right. yeah. So, you know, and then by 2006, you have Judith Butler, you know, a pacifist allegedly saying, yes, Hamas and Hezbollah are members of the global progressive left because they're anti-imperialist. Well, they're not anti-imperialist. They're anti-American imperialism. But they're some of the most ferocious imperialists on the planet. And so as a result, you really have sort of a complete disorientation of the intellectual elite in the West. But, you know, I, you kind of almost just answered a question and, and it, that I've already asked is, how is it that Islamists uh, and Muslims in general became portrayed as an inherently victimized and structurally oppressed group that needs to be uplifted and cosseted by Western progressives? And mm -hmm. is there an analog to the Aldora story that's played itself out in the West that you think? Well, uh, actually, those are two different questions. Um, yep. I'm yeah, sneaky. Like, I'm okay. sorry. No, that's okay. Um, in answer to the first one, what was the first one again? You know, how is it that Islamists essentially became oh, a protected yes, yes. class? So I think that, that that is very much related in the Israeli context by switching the nature of the conflict from the Arab-Israeli conflict to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And so the Palestinians became the minority that was being oppressed. This was possible more or less after 67. Um, so, and, and the Adura image of the boy in, you know, being shot was taken as an image that, to quote a French journalist, erased and replaced the picture of the boy in the Warsaw Ghetto. So, you know, you, you have Holocaust inversion entering the public sphere in a ferocious way. So on that level, the Palestinians were viewed as the, the, the people whose rights were denied as the, the, the oppressed minority. When it came to America, I think what happened was everybody was afraid that, or a lot of people were afraid that there would be an assault on American Muslims, and they're a minority, and they're not a particularly empowered minority, or at least they weren't in 2000. 
And so George Bush gives this speech in which he says, you know, my fellow Americans, Muslims around the world, and certainly our fellow citizen uh, American Muslims were appalled at what happened, which was not the case. Um, and Islam is a religion of peace, and this has nothing to do with Islam. You know, so you've got the president of the United States, the six days after 9-11, the smoke is still billowing from the ground there, saying this attack, which was which was carried out by 19 fervid Muslims, has nothing to do with Islam, which is just you know, it's bizarre, but it was it was intended as a therapeutic speech. It was intended to say, look, it's really inappropriate to attack American Muslims for this attack that came from these fanatics, um, which is fine, I guess. I mean, I, I in my book, I suggest an alternative speech that he could have given. But um, but it's one thing for the president at a key moment uh, to encourage people not to be violent against American Muslims. But it's also appropriate for scholars who know that Islam is one of the most belligerent religions on the planet and certainly the most belligerent um, monotheistic religion. Uh, it took Christianity 300 years to get that kind of violent, and they did it, you know, in the lifetime of the prophet. So you've got, you would have expected the American public to learn about Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Kharb and, and what the thinking of people like bin Laden and the other jihadis is. And it turns out if you read Hamas's uh, charter, Hamas as well, um, you know, the kind of imperialist vision they had of conquering the realm of the sword and imposing the realm of Islam, of submission. But that didn't right. happen at all. Right. Now, one of the, in, an anonymous attendee has put forth a, uh, a question or more of a statement, but I'm just going to bounce it off you. Okay. They say that the religion of the left has much in common with uh, the, the agenda or the, the religion of Islam, and I'm going to actually alter that and say that with the agenda of the Islamists. Okay. Um, yeah, the global mission to impose their delirium, both the followers of these religion of these agendas, so to speak, know or believe that theirs is the only valid religion. Right. And followers of both of these religions know that their faith makes them the best, most intelligent, most moral of the human beings. It seems like there is a similarity between the people on the far left who seem unable to stand up to Islamism because they think that they have the one true faith. Uh, or a uh, worldview, right. and yet at the same time, the Islamists think that they're actually enacting a version of, of their utopia. Right, right. <laughs> it, so, it, it, first of all, I, in the book, I, I mentioned that, you know, this is a millennial vision, a lot like Marxist, which is much sharper in what's wrong with the world than what the world will look like, you know, once the victory of the proletariat has taken place. Um, he's very vague on what, you know, life in the utopia will look like. And so are, are these various groups. So what they can focus on, uh, what's his name? Um, Eric Hoffer in The True Believer wrote, um, mass movements do not need a God, they only need a devil. And you have a shared devil amongst the progressives, these these two groups that anonymous attendee comments on. And his description is a good description, both of uh, a millennial movement that believes that it's come to bring the world to perfection and destroy evil. Um, but it's also true of both Islam and Christianity in their early stages, when they were uh, millennial and apocalyptic, which is a kind of supersessionism, which is we are we have replaced and erased um, the previous claimants to be the chosen people, the previous claimants to be the moral cutting edge of the universe. And certainly, I think that that's what's going on in the global left. the The reason why they're so eager for news about Israel behaving badly is because it puts them it 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 drops Israel from its moral heights and they lose the moral high ground and and it's not that they lose their moral high ground to terrorists who 
teach their children to kill them. It's that they lose their moral high ground to the left, which believes that it is the moral cutting edge of the planet. And that's certainly how I think Judith Butler thinks about it. That's how, um, you know, across the boards, um, amongst the sort of uh, uh, cutting edge, uh, the woke, they really believe that, you know, this is the only way to be and that they have the right way to be and that everybody else is wrong. Um, and in, in fact, worse than wrong, they're, they're evil, they're racists, they're, they're awful people. So, yeah, I think that. Now, I, I got a copy of a book that was written by a, a, a mainline Protestant about uh, basically, essentially, the evils of Israel, and I'm writing a review of it. And uh, one of the interesting things about this text is, is that it declares that uh, that the author is a sojourner on, he basically gives a land acknowledgement and that he's a sojourner on land that's previously owned by the, the Native right. Americans here in the United States. Right. And what he's doing is, is that essentially he's acknowledging that he is in fact a settler. Right. And, but he's doing it in such a way, he's referring him to himself as a sojourner that somehow takes away the, the vile status of his settlerness, I guess, or his westernness, and yet, yet at the same time he's assailing Israel, and implicitly he's assailing all of the other westerners that he, you know, inhabits North America with, right. in such a manner to basically make them almost legitimate targets for Islamist hostility, but he's one of the good guys. Uh, how do we counter that? Well, I mean, there are two really interesting issues here. One is he believes that by doing penance for what his ancestors have done and recognizing the people they've wronged, that that makes him, puts him in a better position. And there's no question that doing penance for things that our ancestors have done wrong is, a, is worthwhile. I'm not sure how far that penance should go. Uh, after all, you know, the sins of the fathers shouldn't be visited upon the sons. But th the other aspect of it that's really bizarre is if anybody should be acknowledging who the indigenous population was that they displaced, it would be the Arabs acknowledging the Christians and the Jews who lived in this land long before they came, including in places like Iraq, where, you know, Jews were a major presence long before Islam, even long before Christianity existed. So, you know, obviously there's a confusion here, but I would say that, you know, my guess is that he's probably, I should probably look at the book and use it in the article I'm writing about progressive supersessionism. He clearly believes that he is the moral cutting edge and that the Jews are the sort of quintessence of everything evil about his society. Well, see, now this is one of the things that I've paid attention or, or been struggling with is that, and I mentioned it previous, and I've also mentioned it a lot in my conversations with you, is, is that essentially all of this, the, the methods used to essentially demoralize, demonize, and disorient Israeli Jews are now being deployed against young Westerners here in the United States and in Europe. Yes. Yes. Okay. And you asked me, you asked me earlier if there's a, a parallel to the Aldura. The Aldura affair. I would say it's what happened in um hold on, my memory is not as good as it used to be. Um Michael Brown at Ferguson. Ferguson. Okay, so you've got a case where the story that's told is exactly the opposite of what happened. And this is, you know, this is, we know this from an investigation by the Obama, by the FBI during the Obama administration. So we're not talking about, you know, a kangaroo cord. Um, they had every reason to want to support that narrative and they didn't. So here you have a fake story, which is, told it's the the community dissenters are intimidated into not telling the real story um then the fake story which is what what Nietzsche Polar calls a lethal narrative it's a story that's designed to create hatred and 
and direct violence against the people who are the bad guys in the story, namely the police. Um, it's it's sort of nailed in with this this uh, expression, hands up, don't shoot, which is concocted. And it leads to riots. It also leads to an alliance with the Palestinians. And so in a sense, I think that that, that story did as much to spread a kind of America is evil at the core and the victims have the right to violence against them as did the Adura case. It wasn't as bad and the reaction wasn't as vicious. We haven't seen suicide bombings in America yet. But in, in some senses, it played the same role. And I'd go so further and say in the same way that Adua set up the Janine massacre meme two years later, the Ferguson account set up the George Floyd response two years later, or five years later. Right. Now, uh, uh, last, uh, last summer, I was out camping in uh, Western Massachusetts, and I had a camp, a map to uh, one of the campgrounds that I was at. And it was a land acknowledgement on uh -huh. that map. Right. And I got a little cranky and I, you know, and I, I, I said those types of land acknowledgements uh, legitimize violence against the American Republic and against its inhabitants, just the same way that delegitimizing uh, the Jewish state legitimized violence against, uh, you know, Israelis. And, and, and uh, part of me said, well, that's a little crazy, Dexter. But at the same time, it, it, logically i i couldn't really assail it am i wrong am i maybe i'm off base but what do you think yeah, i think i think that may be first of all you know certainly we haven't seen the the uh, i'm not even sure what we're supposed to call them the 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 uh the first nations have not behaved like the jihadis right, right. so our acknowledgement that we actually did a whole lot worse. And the white man in America did a whole lot worse to the Indians or to the native, the, the First Nations than Israel has done to the Palestinians. And yet the reaction of the jihadis is infinitely more violent and vicious than the reaction of the First Nations. So uh, I'm not sure that uh, the parallel... You know but really do you think that, that that sense of grievance can be appropriated by other political actors to... to well, yeah, I mean, I think it has been. And I think that sort of the most worrisome is the Black Lives Matter movement, which, you know, I mean, very much like the Palestinian lives matter, the only lives that matter are the ones that are taken by the enemy. So when Arabs kill Arabs and Palestinians kill Palestinians... Um, the press isn't interested. Nobody's interested. When blacks, if you point out that far more blacks are killed by blacks than by white policemen or even any kind of policeman, um, you're accused of racism. So there's a kind of, there's a, there's a dimension to it that I think is extremely dangerous. The whole idea of, you know, defunding police or, and, and that's a formal move, but there's the informal move of, you know, policemen are backing off and they're not uh, getting involved because they're just in for trouble if they do. Um, that situation can lead and has led in some cities uh, like Chicago to really endemic violence at levels that, you know, a civil society can't bear for too long. Now, one of the things that I have seen on uh, in Islamist discourse is this notion that that Islam and their agenda can actually provide the order that is lacking in Western civilization. Right, right. And it seems as if, you know, this wokeism is creating a sort of chaos that Islamists hope to be able to capitalize on <laughs> right, uh, right. in the West. And how do we counter that? So I think, again, here's an interesting parallel because the jihadis job in places like Syria or um, Nigeria or Sudan or any number of the, the Kashmir is to create chaos. They are bearers of chaos um, and they feed off that chaos. I mean, ironically, the same way the Palestinians 
um, Arafat used to tour the Palestinian refugee camps and recruit his fedayeen from amongst the youth in those refugee camps. So, and in the same way now, you've got Syrian jihadis who are exploiting the millions of refugees that they've created uh, as a sort of nursery for creating their, their forces. I do think that in some senses, there is a parallel here in that, you know, if you look at the, the policies that are being pursued by, let's call them the, the woke camp, um, you're really looking at policies that are much more designed to destroy than build up. There's no, there's no, um, there's no real program for a sane and sound society in the kinds of, um, uh, what's it called, uh, cancel culture, specifically around something like trance, where, you know, you're, you're dealing with you're dealing with some really heavy issues that are being pushed and pushed in ways that are really undermining the very fabric of a culture. And, uh, you know, I think we're much more vulnerable than we think we are. We, uh, I once compared the Western Westerners to, you know, people who are driving at, uh, a hundred miles an hour on a motorcycle in snowy mountain road without headlights and think that they can't be touched because, Hey, you know, look at all our technology. Right. All right. So uh, one last question. And I, you, I've understood you and I, I don't mean this as an insult. Okay. But you're a man of the left. You're somebody that wants to promote <laughs> the the welfare humanity of welfare, okay? And or, excuse me, the welfare of humanity. And okay, uh, yes, yes. And so that's really what you're hoping to accomplish. And but can the left, because of this wokeism, stand up to Islamism? No, I don't and think in any way, shape, or form. In fact, all they're doing is is feeding it. Um, you know, I, my book is addressed to people on the left. And, and basically what I'm saying is from 2000 on, you have really lost your way. You've really, you've betrayed the very values you claim to treasure. Uh, and you can see it in, there's a statement by uh, Ian Buruma in the New York Times in 2003, where he says it's, a, it's become a litmus test of liberal credentials to be pro-Palestinian. And he's saying this at the height of the suicide terror campaign. So, you know, that's not any liberal that I know is a supporter of people who teach their children to go blow themselves up amongst the children of their designated enemies. Uh, and yet somehow it became the litmus test of the left. So the left really, in my mind, sort of went off a cliff in 2000, and it's only gotten worse. Now, can the woke, let's put the woke aside for a moment, can sound uh, progressive minds overcome this? Yes. But as I say at the end of my book, you, you just have to reread this story, and you've got to realize that this Palestinian cause, which you've made holy, is actually corrupting you right to the core of your 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 values, and you can right. see it at the worst examples of it are the Jews like Peter Beinert. Okay, well, with that, I'm going to bring this to an end, and I just want to thank everyone here. And uh, as some of you may know, the Middle East Forum has worked to document the impact of Islamist influence on the legislative process in Washington, D.C. And uh, if you want to learn more about this research, please text Islamist Watch to 52886. Uh, Just go to your cell phone, open up your text message application, and text the number 52886 and text the words Islamist Watch. And by so doing, you will subscribe to email and text messaging updates about our efforts to educate both the general public and lawmakers about events like Ilhan Omar's Islamist-backed bill that would establish Islamophobia SAR in Washington, D.C., which is one of the things that's a phenomenon that we've kind of spoken about, or the sale of F-16 fighter jets to Turkey. 
Uh, so right. again, <laughs> one last time, Islamist Watch to 52886. And I also want to ask everyone to check their emails for the upcoming MEF webinars on Wednesday. Uh, Ashley Perry will speak about the impact of international pressure on the process of the coalition building in Israel. And also on Friday, Alberto M. Fernandez will speak about events in Sudan. And with that, I want to uh, say Wait, hello can I say, thank you. Can I say one last thing? Sure, yeah. All right. So Lev uh, Citrin asked, why can't we do cognitive warfare too? And yeah. I have a chapter on the Danish cartoon scandal. And what happened with the Danish cartoon scandal was that some radical sheikhs or imams who wanted to create trouble not only took the Danish cartoons, but concocted three others. One as uh, Muhammad is a pig, one as Muhammad being buggered by a dog while he's in prayer, and one of Muhammad is the devil. And they ran this through the Muslim world and Yusuf al-Karadawi got enraged and called for a day of rage and so on and so forth. And the West just backed down and apologized and said, we're so sorry they did this and this is terrible on our part, et cetera. When they should have had those three cartoons on the table at every meeting with the, you know, the, 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 um, the Islamic uh, nation bloc that would meet with them and demand apologies. And they should have said, the blasphemers here are your people, are the the, the troublemakers who are doing this. And it, they didn't do it. Now, Lev asks, why can't we do it? Well, we can do it, but I think we're just prisoners of this insane notion that criticizing Islam is a form of Islamophobia, whereas in fact, not criticizing Islam is a form of cowardice. You know, I, fear is a big issue, isn't it? Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. And it, it's true of also all the responses to cancel culture, which is people are afraid to speak up, you know, and you get picked off. Somebody like Andrew Pesson gets picked off and, you know, he's attacked. And nobody at his institution where he'd been for over a decade and had what he thought were good friends, no one called him to ask him if he in fact said the things that were attributed to him, which he hadn't. Nobody, and nobody stood up for him. And they just watched him get cut off from the herd and, and driven out. All right. Well, with that, I just want to, I, it's a grim note, but it, you know, in your text, one of the things you say is this a, what is it? Courage is the first and therefore the last freedom. And with that, we will thank everyone for attending and uh, hope to see you at our next webinar. Hallelujah and amen. Thank you so much. Thank you.